it's a real pleasure to have Ejhab Asi with us. Uh, most welcome to you. <laughs> Mr. C is uh, at the moment the chairman of the board of the Kofi Annan uh, Foundation, and he just awarded the first three teams with the Kofi Annan Award in our Academy of Sciences here in Vienna. Uh, under the patronage of the federal, federal chancellor of the Republic of Austria. But Mr. C has a long career. He was former secretary general of the International Federation of uh, Red Cross Societies and Red Crescent Societies, and an outstanding career in the UN system with leadership positions, UN aid, uh, UNESCO, uh, parts of UNESCO, and so on. But uh, most and foremost, he is a distinguished alumnus of the Vienna School of International Studies, and he has been inducted in our Hall of Fame uh, by all his merits already. Uh, and the talk this afternoon will be moderated by Antonella Maibochtla, and welcome also to you, Antonella. Thank you. Okay. Um, the topic that was chosen is a topic which uh, would suffice to, to have a talk more than one hour, I suppose. Everything is in it, the title that you proposed. It's uh, uh, COVID, climate, and conflicts. Uh, but Mr. C is very, a careful person. Uh, he calls it a conversation uh, about the new world or new world order. Uh, and I do understand that the main idea is really that uh, it doesn't suffice anymore to look at individual issues, individual problems. We have to find solutions which are, on the one hand, multilateral, because these issues are global issues, and on the other hand, also multi factional. So the issues have to come together, and they are, as we see in various occasions, they are not sep separated, they are together. So that's why in the title, he, there is also this renew the world, uh, which means the change. We all know it's an uphill, an uphill struggle, but it's an uphill struggle that there is no better place, I think, than the Vienna School of International Studies to discuss, because this is what we have to talk to our students all the time about uh, how to bring together these issues and make not only the awareness, but come from words to action. Uh, and that's why I'm really grateful that you accepted to talk here, because you are a man of action. Also of words, I know uh, he speaks very well German, by the way, because he studied at the University of Graz, Germanistic, some time ago. Uh, but it's all about action now, and, uh, and I think it's, it's clear uh, now, even to this small Austrian country, that uh, action needs uh, the cooperation, how we can innovate to the future. Uh, and uh, Ms. May Bochtla has already a, a tradition of working as an advisor to the Federal Chancery on these forward looking approaches, how we can integrate innovation in all the areas that we have from business to bureaucracy, uh, uh, which is in the part of bureaucracy much more difficult as we both know, and I think others in this room uh, also know very well. So it's a pleasure to welcome you, and I look forward to your talk uh, and the discussion. Welcome. Just uh, as a start, I think, you know, uh, Ambassador Briggs very clearly said how we are forward looking and I think let me start with a, with a big question to you. You know, what do you think, what do you think that we need to change? What is your vision of the world 3.0 as uh, uh, Professor Mohammed Yunus always tells me, you know, what is the world 3.0 that we need to create? Yeah, thank you very much. And first of all, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Briggs, for welcoming us here and for the opportunity to come back, you know, into this building and I must say with some little goose bumps, you know, walking in here. And it was almost exactly day by day, 40 years ago, you know, that I had, you know, the great opportunity to you know, sit on this uh, um, entrance exam and given the opportunity to spend, you know, two wonderful years, you know, in this uh, academy. 
And uh, I had also the privilege you know, to have been in a group of wonderful uh, colleagues. And they asked me at the end of our two-year term you know, to uh, you know, make the speech you know, when we were receiving our diploma you know, on behalf you know, of all the uh, academy. And then I, you know, bump into our, our yearbook, you know, which uh, was, uh, you know, at the time summarizing, you know, the uh, yeah, alumni of those days. So, so that's how we looked. So it was very different, you know, how we look today. And, um, but then more than that, you know, I just uh, saw, you know, some of the uh, things that I was saying then and reflecting on it you know, in today's world, because we were talking about the world of 2.0, 2.3.0, etc. And I remember Ambassador Briggs, I think one of our first uh, lectures then was about the world order. And everything was about order, the world economic order, the world political order, and you may remember that UNESCO was even uh, working on the uh, new world communication order. You know, my fear over the years is that if you look at the different shocks and hazards, you know, that we were confronted with, and, you know, either the solutions that we brought to bear or not, so the then order will look pretty much like a disorder today. And the question is then what to do about it. And so allow me, I'm going to read it in German because we, we did it, uh, I did it in German at that time, and that's the... I found a speech, you know, was uh, put, you know, in this book. So, and I quote myself. <laughs> it said, "Die weltpolitische Realität ist von Konfrontationen und Konflikten geprägt." That's what we were saying. We would say nona net. <laughs> yeah, 40 years ago. It's really like this. Yeah? So, mit diesen Konflikten haben wir uns während unserer Ausbildung theoretisch befasst, nämlich das Ost-West Verhältnis die Auf- und Abrüstung, die Nord-Süd-Beziehungen und das Trachten nach einer gerechteren internationalen Ordnung, die Weltwirtschaftslage, die Regionalkonflikte und die Krisenherde im Nahen und im Mittleren Osten, in Südostasien, in Lateinamerika und in Afrika, insbesondere im südlichsten Teil von Afrika, wo damals wir dann ein Apartheid-Regime gehabt haben. So diese Probleme haben zu einer Lähmung der internationalen Organisationen geführt und erfordern, dass die Mitglieder, alle Mitglieder der internationalen Gemeinschaft die Prinzipien akzeptieren und sich zu eigen machen. Prinzipien, die mehr als in der Vergangenheit gemeinsam mit allen Völkern bestimmt werden müssen. Diesen großen Herausforderungen unserer Zeit können wir nur durch solidarische Zusammenarbeit auf allen Ebenen begegnen und jeder Bürger dieser Welt hat eine unmittelbare Verantwortung für den inneren und äußeren Frieden. I could say the same you know, today. So what does it say? It says that uh, we've been always confronted with tensions. You know, the tensions have always been there. We've been always confronted with uh, some level of stress, you know, in the international relations, you know, in the political situation there of, the, uh, of, the, of the world. We've been confronted also with a crisis of all kind. But the question we ask ourselves is that should all those stress, tensions, crises, you know, lead to either a disaster or a conflict, or a catastrophic situation. The fact that it leads to that or not will be depending pretty much of either our action or our inaction. And most of the time, you know, the crises in which we are living are the price we pay for inaction. And then why is it so? Is it so because there are two main characteristics you know, that have been always very important in addressing that? You know, one is leadership. You know, the other one is trust. And those two characteristics have always been supported or undermined by three 
enablers or inhibitors. Politics could be an enabler. At times, unfortunately, it's an inhibitor. It could also be enabled you know, by science or facts or by activism or, to put it you know, most, I would say, uh, positively, engage you know, citizenship you know, on a long term. Now, we can ask ourselves, you know, are all the major decision making that we are facing, you know, characterize, you know, the leadership? Do they always, you know, portray a level of uh, trust, you know, by the citizens themselves? Or are the decisions, you know, being guided by facts or science? Or does politics, you know, make the best use of it in terms of leading to action in the spirit of solving the problems of people? Or with it for short-term gains in terms of what we call either a nationalism or a populism, or you name it? And what is the level of engagement of citizens, you know, both at the local, and it's always important to start at the local level, the national and then the global level? I think this is the kind of a questions that we would like maybe to illustrate, you know, looking into the world 3.0 through the examples, you know, that I've given, which are the themes, you know, of today, you know, COVID, conflict, or climate. But these are, we could say, almost, almost alibis, you know, to dive deeper into what are the, you know, driving forces, you know, behind each of them. So let me start, you know, with COVID because it is most recent. But we could replace, you know, COVID simply, you know, by pandemics. We saw it coming, it happens. And this is for me the biggest question that we need to always ask ourselves. Why are we always so smart to predict things, you know, that can happen and have a very catastrophic uh, impact on our, all of us, but we do not have always, you know, the same level of commitment and engagement, you know, to prevent it from happening? I think the best thing, you know, that could happen to a politician or a diplomat, you know, or a leader or a manager is that you have all the facts and then the science and the data that will tell you there will be a conflict, you know, coming, if nothing is happening. And then you do everything that is possible to prevent it from happening. Or they will tell you, like we often heard, you know, in my part of the world, next year there will be a famine, you know, in the Sahel. Next year there will be a famine in Somalia and the Horn of Africa. And then famine happens. So what did we do with the knowledge, you know, that it will happen in one year's time and that at the end of the day, so that is just the price of inaction, you know, that we are seeing. If you take a part, talk about the climate, you know, it tells you almost, you know, the same thing. I don't know how long, how far back, you know, we can go. You know, the, I remember in my professional lifetime, you know, the uh, biggest conference of environment and development was 92 in Rio. That is my professional lifetime, but that was preceded but by the conference in Stockholm, which was 1972. <laughs> well, almost if you go back, you know, like I did, and then looking at, you know, what we were saying at that time, we'll find a lot of the facts, you know, there, you know, the indication that all was almost, you know, very accurately projecting, you know, what we are living today. So what did we do with it? So then we can really ask ourselves, you know, if political action is really guided, you know, by facts and by science. But I think what is even worse, it is a, a denial, a level of denialism, you know, of it that makes even politicians popular. That the science, you know, tell you this, and you completely refute it, and then lead into a kind of a populism, you know, type of uh, attitude, you know, with the view of getting some short-term gains, and then nonetheless, there is a critical mass, you know, that follow, you know, that will give a certain credibility and legitimacy. And at the end of the day, I think we could reflect on the three issues and say what leadership is about. It is about A, trying to find solutions to the problems, and then B, delivering on the promises that are being made and promises that are being made, you know, to the people. And how can it happen? It can happen, I think, through different stages. One is preparedness or prevention. 
early warning, early alert. But if early warning and early alert is not you know, followed by early action, it does not mean you know, much. And that early action should be then sustained in a way that it will be building resilience in the communities and in the nations so that next time around, when we are confronted with the same type of tensions and the same type of uh, shock, there will be a capacity to withstand you know, that shock. We can all then reflect now in our conversation how much I've been able, really, to be prepared, to prevent, you know, to alert early and then to act early? How much have you been able to do that? Have you been able to do that, you know, in conflicts? We see all, you know, many of the conflicts, you know, coming and they happen. Some of us witness Afghanistan. We're still there. Some of us witness Syria. We're still there. Some of us witnessed Somalia, we're still there. We've witnessed you know, South Sudan, but still there. Northern Nigeria, Pakistan, you can look at the map and then we're still there. We know and we remember hardly you know, when they start and then we never know when they end. Now, if leadership is not able, you know, not only to predict and, and prepare, but most importantly, you know, to find the solutions you know, to those problems, you know, then we can really question you know, what the leadership you know, is about. And you know, what can be done to foster that, to nurture it? Where are the sources of inspiration you know, for such a leadership to happen? You know, where is the enabling environment you know, for it also to happen you know, at the same time? Now, when we move you know, from that leadership position, then we come into the issue of trust. Why would people trust or not? You know, is the big question you know, that we ask. One of the biggest. And if we do not deliver on the promises, of course, you know, trust will be eroded in many different ways. Unfortunately, too many promises made, too many promises broken, and then no accountability at the end of the day. You know, we can't take it, you know, talk, talk it back you know, to COVID and then using it as an example you know, for pandemics. We witnessed you know, a number of times you know, in the General Assembly that all countries come and sign up you know, that we will be eradicating one disease. 30 years later, we're still living with it. We'll see heads of states and governments you know, coming around the table like it happened in Abuja in 2022 years ago. We'll be allocating 15% you know, of our budget to health so that we do not have health crises, you know, like HIV, AIDS, Ebola, and COVID today. So now, with the fingers of one hand, you can count your number of countries, you know, that with that. What is the accountability? So, we then find ourselves in what we call, you know, a cycle of panic and neglect. You know, when the shock, you know, really comes, so we all panic. We come in, so with big battalions, you know, of responses, and then when we think that it subsides, so we neglect it until the next time it comes. But com those pandemics and then those outbreaks, they happen, they start in communities, and when they have to end, they will end in those communities, and those communities, they remember. They remember, you know, when there is an Ebola outbreak, you know, they ask you, where were you, you know, when we were dying of malaria? Where were you, you know, when we had cholera? Where were you, you know, when we have, you know, the yellow fever outbreak, the Lassa fever, the Marburg fever, you know, all those very, very nasty bugs, you know, that did not have, you know, the big, you know, kind of a general concern, you know, that will be mobilizing, you know, everybody to try to respond to that. Unless, you know, the trust is being rebuilt, you know, we will not have, you know, the leadership, you know, that will be leading to the solutions, you know, the problems we see. Apply it again, you know, to conflict, you know, it is the same. What is then happening really in uh, many of those conflicts that we see looming, grooming, and then nothing then will happen. And then some of the actions that used to be taken in the world 2.0, that was even, you know, driving, you know, the response, you know, on the front line, will almost, you know, be stigmatized. I think today it is very sad to say, you know, that Anybody who declare herself or himself as a pacifist, 
or creating a movement you know, for peace is being seen you know, as a naive you know, idealist. You know, pragmatism and then real politic you know, will want it, you know, that. So geostrategy and geostrategic location and of interest will be determining you know, the level of interest or the level of response you know, that we see or we do not see. So nowadays, you know, we have a conflict in the middle you know, of Europe, which is not a conventional war, which is a kind of an invasion you know, that is happening, but revealing you know, many of those problems you know, that we saw you know, coming. Half of the world was divided. It's going to happen. You will do it. The other part, you know, it's not possible. It won't happen. It's not going to happen in the middle of Europe. But what has been done concretely? That I think you know, that is the kind of a question that we will ask you know, ourselves you know, that well. Well, not being nostalgic at, at, at all, but you know, there were times you know, where leaders will emerge seeing the early signs and then try to start you know, taking early action. And we could, I think, in history, in every part of the globe, you know, cite those kind of leaders that continue to inspire us. In the UN, of course, we all go, go back to Kofi Annan, you know, that very early on in many parts you know, of the world, recognized those signs, tried to mitigate you know, the kind of a negative impact it may have, and then kind of a leading you know, to peace. So in Europe, we used to have, I think, a critical mass of such leaders, you know, starting here, I think we were, in, when we are in this academy, inspired by political leaders like Bruno Kreisky, regardless of political belonging, but at least, you know, a certain vision, you know, of the world and a source of inspiration. Sweden, you know, had, you know, his Olaf Palme, and I think Germany had, you know, their Willy Brandt, no, you name it, and it goes on and on. And I think today what we're really missing is, you know, since Angela Merkel, I'm sorry to say, left power, that, you know, we have, you know, the kind of leaders that will be standing up, you know, to those great challenges, you know, of the world, you know, that a big question mark and a vacuum, you know, somehow. It does not mean that we have to go back and recreate or clone, you know, those kind of people. But the question we ask that how a world 3.0 can also you know, bear leaders 3.0 that will be responding you know, to the issues you know, of their time. Because the issues of the times you know, will be very different. Today, the world is more interconnected than ever before. The world you know, is more digital than ever before. We can uh, spouse you know, ideas and then spouse uh, ideologies, you know, beyond, you know, our geographic confines. So the nationality that you carry does not necessarily determine, you know, the things that you stand for or you don't or you fight for. And we can see that in positive ways and in negative ways. I worked in humanitarian settings, you know, in me for many years. And what moved me most, you know, for just, you know, critical mass of people who care so much about issues, you know, that were happening 10,000 miles away, you know, from home, and then mobilize a force for good to try to respond to that. So I walked, you know, in the middle of winter in cities like Stockholm or even Copenhagen, and then I saw young people, you know, holding a Red Cross, you know, kind of a box, you know, mobilizing resources, you know, for South Sudan or, or, or Bangladesh, where there was a flood or Syria, or, um, or the refugees you know, in Cochise Bazaar. So I do not have a Red Cross West, but as the uh, CEO of the International Federation of Red Cross, I will start and then spend half an hour talking to those you know, young people and then got some of the times, you know, the best lessons of geopolitics and what global solidarity means and what global uh, uh, citizenship means, you know, telling us what leaders are repeating now more and more, none of us is safe until we all are. We heard it at Museum, you know, during COVID. But the question is, you know, what do we do about it? And then we see that commitment of a younger generation, you know, coming in, that, you know, that give us hope, you know, in either pandemic prevention or fighting for, you know, the better protection of our environment to mitigate climate change or for a culture of peace and then nonviolence so in that regard, 
Now, if we look at it you know, from that perspective, then we see also that mistrust is going all along you know, to institutions. We live at times when the world is more interconnected, where we can access information you know, much easier than ever before, where a governor you know, of any organization is the man on the street, where a blogger you know, can be more efficient you know, than a board member you know, to put things you know, on the table, at the same time, then, then we are so fragmented you know, than ever before. So how do we deal you know, with that paradox? And I think that is one of the big questions for the conversation also we should have you know, at the same time. Now, the other question that we need really to ask ourselves you know, here is that COVID is a very good example of it. None of us is safe until we all are. We all agree. But then when masks you know, are available, they are grabbed by, the, by some of the few. So what does it mean then, then to have a minority that is 100% pro protected and a large majority that is 3% protected, protected in a pandemic that is threatening everybody? Later on, not only you know, with masks, but sim simple things you know, like masks, and then goes to PPEs, which is the personal protection uh, uh, equipments that were needed even to protect health workers. Totally broke down, total breakdown in the supply chain, supply chain and concentration you know, in few geographic areas. Now come vaccines. In many parts of the globe, we are talking about you know, the forced dose. And I read you know, in the plane this morning that you know, some countries are calling their citizens you know, to prepare for the autumn and then get ready for a fifth you know, dose you know, where necessary, where a number of parts you know, in the world you know, between 3% and then 10% you know, of coverage. So, and the science tell us we are better protected when we have 50-50 across the board, or 70-30 you know, rather than 97-3. You know, but nonetheless, you know, that is not what is guiding you know, the you know, type of a decision that we are seeing. Now, I'm coming back to COVID climate and conflict to take it back you know, to preparedness, early warning, early alert, early response, and then resilience building, to take it back you know, to leadership and engage citizenship or activism, you know, to take it back also to a movement that is really badly needed, which is a movement of people and a movement of people who care. Now, when we look at the Constitution or the preamble of the, uh, the, preamble of the uh, United Nations, it did not say, you know, with the government, it did not say with the countries, it said with the people. But I think meanwhile we seem to have forgotten that until there is a new generation that is reminding us that, that every week you know, on the street, being impatient, being angry, that we are not doing enough for the climate, that also we are being challenged you know, by every corner, that more than ever before we need diplomats and then people coming out, schools you know, like this one, but in a different way, in a way that is more diverse, in a way that is more inclusive. Well, Diplomats you know, used to be characterized or caricaturized you know, as old men in dark suits. Now, I think it is heartening to see you know, more women, more younger people. So the multilateral system used to be reduced only to the General Assembly of the UN, where we see now that uh, we need a greater space and a much larger space, you know, where young people, women, private sector, alongside of representative governments and other forms of organization of civil society, you know, will find you know, their way in. So that gives me hope you know, in the middle of doom and gloom, you know, that is characterizing the tensions that we will always have in our world. There's no doubt about it. But it is exactly because we have those tensions, exactly because we have those stresses, exactly because we have those crises that we need that movement of solidarity you know, more than ever before. And that is, you know, that we invite people for. And then if we get that, we can better address COVID or pandemics. We can better address the climate. We may be able to prevent better conflict. And when it happens, you know, to protect civilians and mitigate, you know, its impact, you know, on poor people. So let me stop there and hope that we'll have a conversation. No, thank you very much, El Hatch. I think you all, this is uh,
there is so much food for thought that I'm uh, really trying to perhaps to capture a couple of, of things that you said. I think all this, if you want, bad seas, you know, COVID, conflict, climate, and we could add, you know, corn in terms of uh, food shortage that we are uh, living with, we have to live with, and cost, which is also the the inflation that we are living. These are these all five C's that we that we are challenged with require, according to what you said, definitely, you know, when we look at how to, to confront them, much more collective action. I would call them the positive C's, you know. You mentioned the connectivity, the, collect, the, the, the connectivity between people, between institutions, between those who are really caring, where they need care of people, they need collective action. So there are the positive C's who have to fight the bad C's who are needed in terms of response to that. And, uh, and, and I would say capacity building in a positive sense, capacity building in various areas. So this was uh, very clear from what you said. But I would like to, to go on one, basically come back to my initial question, which is not an easy question to answer, and it is about what is the vision of the world 3.0 that we need? What is it that we need to, to change? What, what are the transformatory activities? I mean, you clearly said about the, pre, the, the, the capability to, to be prepared, the preparedness, the resilience. I think these are all important topics, but what do we need, you know, what, what else do we need and what creates this preparedness and, and resilience? And let me add one point that, that you also make. Our predictive capabilities have increased. They have increased enormously. We can predict everything. We can measure many more things. We have more facts. We have more data. We have an improvement in predictive capability. And, I, and I've experienced it myself in the future operations board, which I'm co-leading. On COVID, we had we have every morning we have all the data there. You know, we also know what actions work in which areas. We had a continuous review of actions that work, and then you know to put those actions, you know, on the ground really to bring them on the ground. That's where there is a break of the system. It's very difficult to get there, and you. Uh, you, 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 the point that you gave is, you know, we, have, we need the leaders 3.0, we need, you know, more diplomacy, we need the force of the people, we need more young people, I mean, we need all this collective action, but to get from sort of the predictive capability, from understanding what is coming, to putting the action on the ground, there is a break. And I think the two points that I would like to understand from you, first of all, you know, what is the world 3.0 that is the more resilient and more responsive world? And what do we need on the, on the who side? You know, who are the, what do we need to do in terms of leadership to get there? You know, what is the psychograph of the leader 3.0? Well, there, I think there are a number of elements in there. One is, uh, there will be a kind of a dynamic, you know, I would say almost natural evolution you know, of the world that will happen regardless of what we do or what we don't. I mean, everybody will all, always have to live in her or in his time. So the train has left the station. So time you know, is a factor that you cannot subdue. The space you know, is different, but time is the symbol of course, almost of our uneasiness because it will take over, you know, some of us will disappear, you know, new people will emerge, you know, new forms of society you know, will happen. I think that is a kind of a almost a natural evolution that will be happening. That will come with its forces, it will come also with its strengths. One of the forces that I see is that the World 3.0 will be looking more like of a world of people rather than a world of institution. Mm -hmm. And part of it, it is the mistrust in institutions, you know, but part of it is just a different forms of engagement that does not require institutions. We can see it in very, very simple ways. I think 20 years ago, 
which is not a long time ago, you know, if people were saying that, you know, with a small device you're in your hand, you'll be communicate to anybody anywhere in the world. I think many people will say you're crazy, you're mad. This is not, you know, possible. So it is possible. And then we'll have to live with that, you know, in one way or the other. Well, if you are in institutions, and, and that's where sometimes the disconnect is, you know, that somebody with an idea or a young person, you know, that with a perspective or innovation like we were talking about, would like them to come and see a CEO and then discuss with her or him, then they will need an appointment and then go through different, three different secretaries and so on, trying, you know, to put, you know, the gate all along. But then you realize, you know, by the time you are doing all of that, you know, that young person has sent an email, you know, to that CEO, and by the time you realize, he or she already has responded. And then things, you know, will be completely, you know, different. And that's what I was referring to, that in that kind of a world, every blogger, you know, become a governor, you know, every person on the street with an access to internet becomes a whistleblower. And many actions, you know, often that are taken that would otherwise, you know, be into a very cumbersome decision-making process, you know, will be leading to some kind of reaction, you know, that people will say, well, you were saying something about my company that I read, you know, in this blog, then then act on it, which sometimes, you know, much faster than in a many different ways. So now you can contribute into managing that or shaping it. Because if you don't manage it, it can also lead to, you know, the most uh, destructive, you know, ways of uh, operation. So we're living at times now where the fake news are taking over, you know, any other news and influencing decisions. Some of the populist <coughs> decisions are really based, you know, on fake news. And that is eroding not only the trust, but also the ethical principles you know, around governance, which is building your argument tire on that and even lying frontly you know, in, in front of people becomes okay because of the short-term gains. That's the reason why it is very important you know, to manage. The second thing is you know, how to shape it. So engaged citizenship and that leadership is about you know, the future we want. And that will not happen in the future. It will happen today. The question is, what can we do today <coughs> in order to have the future we want. And that's, again, coming back to our discussion this morning, what innovation is about, what entrepreneurship you know, is about, what education you know, is about. And I think for part of the world I'm coming from, that becomes a number one you know, element. Many of us here are sitting, talking about these issues, having an opportunity to discuss them, being in positions you know, where we can make decisions that will be impacting on people, the entry point you know, of that you know, is really education. So unfortunately, uh, that is not the good that is you know, the best uh, <coughs> distributed along the world, around the world, and if it continues you know, to be that, you know, then we will face the problem. Now, that identifies very concrete entry points you know, where we can act today in order to have that, education, health, and rights you know, of people. Because we do a lot of things you know, in development, we do a lot of things in you know, humanitarian settings, providing food to people, emergency you know, medical supplies, all of that extremely good, and I think we need to do it. But what is most important to everyone, no matter where they live, no matter in the which condition they are, it is to protect what is most important to them, which is their human dignity. When that dignity then is eroded because of lack of education, because of lack of health, because lack of protection and lack of rights, we have the fertile ground, you know, where from which you know all these challenges of our time, you know, will be growing from. And I think there will be many more, but these are definitely some entry points, you know, that we really need to invest heavily, work on it, and then build the necessary partnerships, you know, for that. Often when we talk about the partnerships, we talk about ODA or partnerships you know, between governments, that's all okay. But we need partnerships you know, among academic institutions, 
training institutions, we need partnerships between different segments of societies, men, women, young, old, private sector and the public sector, as well as also the kind of decisions we are making where the investments can be made, either in the rural or in the urban settings. All these provide opportunities you know, for true partnership building, but also at the same time entry points for real action to, in order to shape and change you know, some of the dynamics. If left alone, you know, will be for sure producing, I think, you know, some results that we can all share, but many times also can produce challenges you know, that will haunt us for many times. Just Thank you for, for these comments. Just let me come to what type of leaders do we need? Because you mentioned the issue about trust. Trust as an enormously important element to be able to, to shape things, to also to, to get action in the right direction, to communicate things and so on. And I wonder what you, uh, what your observation is. I think it, it, on the one side you said we need, of course, to have this, if you want, this crowd-based activity, so it needs to become more bottom-up. But then what is the role of the top-down, you know, of the, the leaders and shapers? I think that, that and, and you being yourself a leader and shaper, you know, what is your experience about the next generation of leaders and shapers that are coming up? What would you give them as a sort of as a guidance on, on what they need to focus on, what they need to be good at? Well, I can only say what I observe, which I think you know, is leading into the right direction. And um, they may have gotten it from different sources. Some got it from their own education and upbringing, from their families inspired by their mothers or whoever else you know, that could put them in that path. You know, through their academic training and also the life experiences with which they were confronted. And out of that, you know, emerge you know, some of the leaders, you know, that of today and that will be projecting themselves, you know, into tomorrow. I think they all have in common one thing, they care. They all have in common the good understanding of their context. They have a good awareness, you know, of the challenges, you know, they face. And also they have, you know, the innovation to start finding solutions to those challenges. And if you bring those four together, you know, it will be resulting in something which is very important for every leader, which is in having a vision, you know, of what you would like to achieve. And this, some learn it, some are trained for it, you know, some I don't know have not fell on it, some bring it out of, you know, their background. And I saw some of those leaders out of the most difficult circumstances emerging. I saw some of those early leaders, leaders which are the wealthiest, you know, kind of a settings, you know, where they could live in comfort and not caring about anything, but also questioning, you know, that status quo themselves. And I think we need, you know, those elements, you know, in each that I just observe and then bring it into a vision that is orienting to, in whichever way, in whichever way we set it, finding solutions to problems you know, that we face, and also delivering on the promises that we make that we will deliver. I think this is the kind of a leadership not of tomorrow. But what he's saying already, we are seeing it, if we observe very carefully that even a credibility through a nomination of election does not necessarily confer, not always, you know, the type of leadership you know, that we will see. We will see most of the time the legitimacy and the credibility of one's agenda that will give the much stronger leadership you know, in many ways. And it is not by chance you know, that if you, know, you see uh, many of the uh, issues of our time when we need somebody to carry it, we're not often looking at to the conventional leaders you know, that we have. And uh, I was saying it also with a smile, but it was some kind of quite be, some can be quite worrisome. So my last uh, participation in the General Assembly week about two years ago, 
So the biggest agenda, you know, on the, one of the biggest agenda on the table was about refugees. I think that's when we were hitting the 100 million mark, you know, at the time. Well, the most vocal voice that was listened to by everybody and political leaders and then heads of agencies were rallying around was, I see you smiling, Angelina Jolie. <laughs> so who elected Angelina Jolie? You know, what is the, uh, I would say, representativity and legitimacy of it, except, you know, the credibility and legitimacy of the agenda she carries. So I moved over, went to UNICEF House, which uh, where I spent many years working. We're talking about child's rights and striving uh, beyond surviving, which was the motto. So everybody who was sitting here, decision makers, listening to Shakira. Mm -hmm. So I crossed over, went to UNDP, so we were talking about, you know, the um, debt cancellation and the more equi uh, equitable relationship, you know, in trade, and then challenging a lot of the status quo that we're seeing, who was there, it was Bono. Now, the day after, there was the biggest, you know, side event, you know, on health, who was leading the discussion for the world, that was Bill Gates. I think we are seeing now more and more, you know, that kind of a, you know, leadership. One can, everybody is free, I'm just putting the facts, you know, mm -hmm. to think over, you know, what does it really mean? So one thing among many that I can say for sure is that the legitimacy and the credibility of the agenda one carries would confer to someone a level of leadership as long as he or she delivers on the promises that then he or she makes. The question is, what promises and how far, you know, how sustainable, and how can you drive you know, others along the same path? And I think that is something that we will have to discuss and reflect on almost every time. But may I take, take this point up? Because I think, you know, the, it, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, you mentioned Angelina Jolie, Shakira, Bono, and this morning we had the discussion about the, the role that Jennifer Lopez had in raising um, funding for the Grameen uh, microcredit uh, activities uh, for uh, um, young women. And it shows one thing that to elevate the visibility of a cause you need a different communication approach. And these people are very good at elevating the visibility of a cause. They may not be the right people to solve the cause, but they, they create the visibility and they trigger action. But then you need to do the sort of, after having achieved visibility, you need to do the heavy lifting of putting things then really, really delivering on the cause and delivering the solutions. And I think that it's two different things, you know. One thing is those who are creating the visibility and the other ones are those who are implementing the solutions. And I think, a, as I mentioned before, we may have a break point in the implementation even of things that we know are the right solutions. And so I think that's a bit, you know, and I don't, I don't think that Unfortunately, neither Angelina Jolie nor, nor Jennifer Lopez can deliver on that. Yeah, no, I told you I said it with a smile, of course. No, no, uh, but I think it's a, it's a super think that, relevant, I think a, it's a relevant observation. There. But I think the most serious thing is, it doesn't matter where you go, in any part of the world, in any communities, you will find people waking up every day, you know, developing solutions, you know, to their problems. Do we find them? Do we value them? Do we support them? Do we create an enabling environment, not only for their emergence, but to sustain you know, their response? And not to shift them the burdens when they are doing well, to shift the burden of all the response to their shoulders at all. And that is the reason why we need to do all those different levels you know, of leadership you know, that is happening. And I think there is a particular responsibility of people who come either to power or through elections, or through the privilege you know, that one has of benefiting you know, from either education or resources of the community of the country you know, to carry a certain responsibility 
which is then at different forms of leadership at different levels, you know, to contributing to the solutions, you know, of the time. And I think that is, you know, the bottom line that we are seeing and many of the things that we're doing, you know, if you, if you don't call it leadership, you know, it kind of boils down, you know, to that. And, and we need those very different levels. But I think there is a breakdown here that is a little bit, you know, worrisome, you know, that, you know, leaders that will, from whom we expect the early action, you know, and the sustained, you know, action to some of the bigger problems of our time are getting fewer. And sometimes, you know, they are being some kind of inhibited, you know, either by political challenges of theirs or short-term gains that they would like to see. And that, I think, have to be challenged by citizens, you know, in order to move into the right direction. Mm -hmm. Let me open up the, the possibility to ask questions to uh, Mr. Asi and make sure that you kept, we, we really capture your uh, interest and, and the questions that you have, since you raised so many, so many challenging topics and, and fascinating topics. I would like to ask if you have direct questions. And I think, you know, I think I that, think uh, <laughs> that, that in this case, it's the, not the ladies first, the lady, the lady second. <laughs> yeah. yeah, us. Um, Michelle, mm -hmm. merci. Uh, we studied together, you see. Wonderful. I mean, this is a, uh, this is a class the, reunion, I understand. It's a class know? reunion. I don't know. And oh, we are a little bit disturbing on the no. class reunion. No, ask uh, a question which uh, is, I think, very important. You said about the one world, connectivity. But do we not have a, a, a very even stronger... Um, movement now, which is awful, it's nationalism. Mitterrand, uh, I remember just, um, just as his, one of his last speeches in the European Parliament, he said the very famous sentence, le nationalisme c'est la guerre. And unfortunately, we are at this point, at least in Europe. And a second question to that. Do you think that this is the right way to deliver uh, uh, more and more weapons and not to try to find a solution through negotiations at the Ukraine war? Thank you. Thanks, Michel. I, I, I think the, my, my main point, really, that is cutting across you know, conflicts and COVID and climate is really the uh, preparedness, the prevention, and you know, to prevent shocks and tensions from becoming either a conflict or a catastrophic situation or a disaster. We can live with the tensions, and they will always live with them. The fact they become and take that development will be either a price of our inaction or we contribute in two, leading it into the direction for short-term gains. And I think that's what we call often, you know, nationalism or populism, you know, in many, you know, different ways. There is a danger and a tension here that we manage, that we see popping up, you know, in many, many different settings. Now, and that is a paradox really that I see here. I see really a true movement of global citizenship. I see that. Amplified by social media, amplified by access to internet, amplified also by, I think, a simply a Weltanschauung of another generation, which is uh, very different. You can see that. It is not always you know, the most powerful, it is not always the most vocal, it is not always the most seen. But then on the other hand, you, know, you have you know, what you're describing. And our world is really sitting you know, on those two. It depends at what point in time you know, the balance is leading to one direction or the other. We are global, we are fragmented. We are interconnected, we are divided. You know, we have common challenges, but we are unequal. So I think those are the kind of paradoxes and dilemma you know, that we have been confronting. And the reason why I'm bringing it always to 
what really active citizenship or activism you know, means. And we should not neglect that. Because if you go back to some of the key challenges in our time, when you have activism behind an issue and then form a constituency for it, then you see a real difference. I'll give you in health two examples. I'll give you the examples of HIV and the example of COVID. You know, there is no constituency for COVID yet. We are a number of them, a number of us are COVID survivors in many ways, but we have not built yet, you know, the kind of a constituency, you know, that we see like, you know, in the HIV epidemic. $20,000 per patient per year were the first treatment. The inequalities of today were right on the table. Well, you have people living with HIV on the forefront and people affected by HIV with their families, you know, building a constituency, you know, to challenge that. All the discussions we're having today in the WTO on patent rights, at that time was about how do you get, you know, parallel importing of drugs, you know, how do you get, you know, uh, compulsory licensing of it. And private sector come together under the leadership of Kofi Annan and then four low and middle income countries reduce it from $20,000 per year to $1,000 per year. And then eight months or nine months later, it went all the way down to $130 per year. And today I think we are on 80. If we have a critical mass of active citizens and activism to challenge those things, you know, it can happen. So if we don't, in many areas of our times, I take you child and maternal mortality, which is a horrible thing that we witness in many parts of the world, including the region that I live in. Where is the constituency for that? Where is it? You know, where is the activism you know, for it that will not challenge you know, the kind of a status quo? We are seeing in climate you know, that emerging now more and more. How will it be sustained is the question that we can ask. But it is there, and I think it is going into the right direction. What I think is not really then happening is that you know, this kind of a global you know, political awareness and consciousness you know, mindset you know, across the board, because it leads in two different directions. You can see, and we witness it. I worked in Syria for almost you know, four years in the difficult circumstances group of young people from Australia, all the way back from Australia, from the suburb you know, of Paris, you know, from all the capital city, going and then fighting alongside jihadists. Uh, for what? Because they spouse, you know, A, an ideology, which is a kind of a reaction for them to what they consider to be an equal you know, type of system you know, that happens. It, lead, it can lead to the direction. That's what I'm saying. If you don't manage it and then you let it flow, it can lead to that. On the other end, I see you know, the greatest mobilization you know, of young people in Cochis Bazar, Bangladesh, across the world, 50 nations you know, coming together in supporting Rohingyas you know, in refugees. I've seen that you know, in South Sudan. I've seen it even recently in Afghanistan after the US have pulled out that you see this kind of movement. So what do we need really to do as citizens and also political leaders? And I said at the beginning, politics can be either a facilitator or an inhibitor. And then those who are the facilitators, you know, bring that critical mass. And it requires vigilance all the time, engagement you know, on the long term, and partnership building on the long term. I think without that, it can lead to you know, all the kind of challenges that will come and haunt us. Was another question there? Um, thank you. Um, I was not part of the class. I hope you can tell. <laughs> I graduated four years ago. My name is Sarah Ducellari. I'm here in my function as legal counsel for the startup ABLE. 
that I think you've heard of or worked together with Andrea Panzelter. My question is in regards to fake news and um, domestic policy, because I found that in the last couple of years, while social media has been a really great tool to connect people, it's made the decision for the leadership harder. We saw this with COVID. Either you would put in restrictions and it was a mistake, you would not make any restrictions, it would be also a mistake. How do you think we can get away from the slamming of politicians via social media so that they can, instead of crisis management of their social media at all times, really get into crisis management of crises that are going on? Thank you. Yeah. So f fake news do not just uh, pop up like that. So there is a whole machinery you know, behind fake news. And what they do is often exploit a vacuum or exploit a situation which you know in the eyes of people in the surface you know can be very attractive let me give you an example so uh, when uh, the we had an Ebola outbreak you know in the Democratic Republic of Congo so Johnson and Johnson you know had a vaccine and then they come and call it an experimental vaccine, you know, for Ebola. So you know very well there are anti-vax campaigners. Now, they use the word experimental, and that is not false, because the scientists will tell you, I have to be truthful, it's experimental. But then, you know, for an outbreak that is happening in Africa, affecting black people, and then white people who protect themselves to experiment a vaccine so that they can be protected. You know, you have a wonderful recipe, you know, for fake news, you know, to happen. But what is not happening is really to explain, you know, when we uh, use, you know, those kind of words or scientific terms to communicate, you know, properly, you know, about it. So that vacuum is filled. Take COVID. Most of the rich countries, you know, they grabbed the vaccines that were available, the Pfizer vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine, and then you had, you know, some cases, you know, of kind of a blood clot. There were not many of the AstraZeneca vaccine. So in Denmark, and some countries banned the vaccine. The next day, you see in a big headline, donation of AstraZeneca vaccines you know, to Africa. Anti-vax campaigner, jump on it. You see what we're telling you. you know, this is where the Pfizer vaccines, you know, where the et cetera, et cetera. So fake news do not just happen like this. They exploit situations. Now, the way to address it is then at least two ways. One is, as much as possible, do the right thing. The second thing is also communicate rightly about you know, what you know, one is doing, and do that in a kind of a proactive way. So there is a whole new department in WHO today called infodemics, because you have the epidemics and the infodemics, you know, that on a daily basis, and I don't remember the latest figure, Yasin, maybe you know, at the last time I checked, there was a about you know 1,000 to 500, 1,500 publications, fake, you know, on a health issue, you know, that like that can, when you read it in the surface, can be attractive, you know, to many, you know, to many people, and I think I saw even very enlightened, you know, political decision makers, you know, on the African continent, rejecting completely. You know, that type of vaccines that were given in a country where they did not even have, you know, 3%. Now, you have other countries, you know, that play it, you know, the other way around. It does not mean they have, you know, maybe the best vaccine or so. China had what they call a vaccine diplomacy. There is no fake news there. This is what I use for China. That is what I'm using, you know, for the world. What is we administering to ourselves, that's what we are giving, you know, to others and then making a whole communication around that. They can be inflated, regarding, you know, to how people look at it. Too. But the bottom line is, you know, to understand where fake news are generated, you know, from, and then what kind of a 
uh, gaps are there, you know, that they're trying to address. And if those are not filled and then communicated properly about, then we will continue to have the fertile ground. And the last point is, you know, to have really decision makers, you know, being vigilant and surrounding themselves, you know, with the good sources of science, you know, to make the decisions. And you've seen many times, even in some places, the best scientists, you know, surrounding the politician, giving the best advice and totally ignored, you know, because of, you know, other gains that have nothing to do with it. So again, we come to the tri triptych of the politics and the science and the activism that we need always to balance, you know, in addressing those issues. Any other question? Please, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, allow me to express my joy to have you here. As a Senegalese alumnus of the Diplomatic Academy, I discovered the Academy through you. So that was very something that inspired me. And I, you can say that you paved the way for a lot of people, young people, to emulate and try to reach that type, that type of leadership that you embody. But I, I would just have a question about how to build trust in the international community. We saw, for example, when the Omicron variant emerged, the travel ban on South Africa, and evidence emerged three weeks later that Omicron was already present in Europe. And everyone was so quick to blame African countries and South Africa in general when they actually invested in genome laboratory to be able to find those, those, that, that variant. We saw in Europe, for example, countries refusing to abide to supranational legislation of the EU concerning COVID because they wanted to protect the national interests. So how do we, let's say, reform the international system in such a way that people will understand that it's not a zero-sum game, my, my gain is not necessarily your loss, and how to make it more, more fruitful in multi-stakeholder partnership, including young people, women, civil society, as you mentioned, but really how to build trust, because that's something I would really be interested in. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, your question is extremely pertinent. I think there is one word that you used. I think if we ban that word in um, the way countries or institutions you know, interact, we will have a foundation for trust, which is blame. I think you know, one of the sources of trust, of mistrust, is the blaming game you know, that often you know, happens, sometimes without any foundation. I think that is one thing to look into. You know, the second is always, you know, try to get, you know, the facts right because you are describing here a very factual situation where South Africa did something wonderful that could save the world, but then was blamed, you know, for it. And then thirdly, the way to build trust is also delivering, you know, on the promises, delivering on the promises. And for me, the biggest issue is that, really. So lack of accountability that we can see across the board in institutions, in governments, and even, I think, in some of the communities you know, that you see you know, leadership not delivering on promises. And if that is not happening, well, there is no accountability, there will be no trust. I think one way to build it is you know, people take their responsibility seriously, and do what they have to do. But the most active way, I think, is to have a really engage citizenship to do it. We need to work with citizens you know, to claim their right. We need to work with citizens to hold those who govern them accountable. You know, we need also to hold you know, the communities and inform them, mobilize them through civil society organizations, through movements, but also institutions all of them, multilateral institutions, technical institutions, also are held you know, accountable to deliver you know, on what is being promised. And I think that is that constant engagement and challenging that will be you know, leading there. And lack of that, you know, trust will continue to be eroded. 
But I think we are also you know, turning a blind eye on certain things, you know, really that were the fundament of the multilateral system. Well, I was talking to, to telling Ambassador Briggs so one of our first the lectures here with the world order. So the world order on, you know, who's the true uh, subject of international law? And then we, we, we had a course, you know, on, you know, multinational, multinationals and then multinational concern at that time. And those were subject of international law because of the elevation beyond, you know, a one particular government. So if we were taught that, and then that gives a certain status, you know, to multinationals. And then you have a crisis, and that same multinational can turn back and say, I cannot do this because my country, you know, prevent me from doing it. I mean, whose country? I think there is something there which is, I think we really need to, to address. I think the privileges as well as, you know, the kind of a status, you know, that the personality, the legal personality that is given kind of a contradict, you know, somehow, you know, the ties that will bind, you know, a particular company then, you know, vis-a-vis -vis what it's supposed to be doing. We saw that in COVID, that export ban, you know, were put, and some countries could not, some companies would not be able to deliver, you know, for other places in need until and unless, you know, they give, you know, the green light. And that's happened across the board. It happens, I think, with some of the big farmer, headquartered in the US, you know, the EU put a point, you know, that, you know, the kind of a command, you know, they made, you know, should be satisfied first. India, you know, put a ban for the Serum Institute of India that was the, one of the biggest sources, you know, for low and middle income countries. And I think all of that contributing again, you know, to the kind of a mill trust and the multilateral uh, system. We put some mechanisms in place, you may know of COVAX, you know, and others. Many countries were said, don't worry, don't even try, you know, to get them, try to get it on the market. We'll have a mechanism that will be delivering. But they did not get the supply. They will not be able to deliver. Now, they will be mistrusted. They will be criticized. And then the whole chain of mistrust happened. And anti-vax campaigners and, you know, uh, fake news, you know, will amplify that you know, in a way that we don't know anywhere, you know, where to turn to. And I think it is very important that we really continue to nurture and nourish, you know, those fundamentals, you know, that the blaming game, you know, should stop. But most importantly, that citizens, you know, be engaged in claiming their rights and in holding leaders and institutions accountable to deliver on, you know, their promises as well as to on their mandate. Any other question? I think it, yeah, because we need to come, unfortunately, very unfortunately, we have to come to an end. Uh, sorry, sorry to come in with, with the question. I also believe in education as, as the, the real trip forward, but I have to say in this part of Europe, we have also the knowledge that we had Nazi Germany. Good educated society, um, full participation of people uh, with the regime, uh, but the result was catastrophic. Uh, so it's a question of what sort of education we can offer and how convincing it is, not only for our, our own national society, but for the global scale. Uh, and the real question is, you didn't speak about uh, the rivalry between democracy and autocracy. In a, in a, uh, in a world 3.0, uh, do you think this will not be an, an essential issue, whether it's democratic or autocratic, it is more about the activism of, of, of young people. I am not so sure when I look at Russia, for instance, at the moment. I think it's because of the autocratic system that the thriving civil society is not able really to change the course of history. Yeah, so when I talk about activism and engaged citizenship, I'm talking about indirectly democracy. And that is really what, um, you know, the governments, you know, of the city by the people, you know, means. And I think that is what should lead, you know, to that. Uh, but there are many elements, you know, in the democracy and the democratic system that we need to be critical enough in order to address them, to move the democracy in the right path. 
Unfortunately, and that saddens me a lot, you know, in some of these uh, outcomes, you know, like health and others, you know, you may find autocratic regimes, you know, deliver much better. Because they have a line of command and control, and then they end up being called, you know, enlightened dictators or whatever they call. But I think in the eyes, you know, of the citizens, you know, in terms of delivering, you know, for their problems, you know, they could be quite attractive. And that's where democratic, you know, regimes and then the democratic processes have really a lot of work to do. And that's when I talk about holding governments accountable, having engaged citizenship. That is really what it is about. Because uh, this will fragilize you know, our democratic system if we only look at the fetishism of some of the acts that we pose. I see many democratic you know, regimes or regimes you know, characterized by such that we invest a lot you know, into a process of election, which is a very good mark you know, of democracy. And people get elected and think that the job is done. And then you wait until the next election instead of now being in a mindset that the job starts the day after you know, the elections. Now, if we continue really to have democratic regimes with all these aspects that we all stand for and we really try to push, and then child mortality remain high in those settings, maternal mortality remain high you know, around those settings, poverty you know, is not eradicated, you know, you will see in those very parts, in those very democratic setting, emergence, you know, of extremist groups that are being, you know, used and abused, you know, by other forces that is coming and threatening, you know, us. So I strongly believe that, you know, the best way, you know, to achieve, you know, peace, stability, as well as, you know, bringing people towards, you know, furthering well-being is a democratic regime. And I think that is one of our key pillars in the Kofi Annan Foundation. And that's what Kofi Annan was standing for. But when we work on that, you know, what we do in many parts of the globe, including in Africa, our engagement is to work harder and harder in those democratic settings, you know, so that they do not fragilize, you know, themselves, you know, by not delivering on the most important, you know, aspect of it. So. I agree with you. I think autocratic, democratic. I think my, of course, leaning and of course preference, you know, is obvious, and that's the reason why I think we need to work very hard on that to make it functional, and then responsive to the needs of people. So thank you very much. I think we are we we are already. I think. You know, we, we are beyond the time that we set. Let me try to summarize a bit, you know, what, uh, uh, what uh, you have been saying and what you have been outlining. I think you started with a very uh, clear view that we have now a world disorder and not, you know, a, not yet the new world order, but we are in a world disorder. And, uh, and in with this world disorder, there are two routes. We are the juncture, you know, we can either go with action and create opportunity, let me put it this way, in a shortened way, or we go and in the disaster if we take inaction, if we do not take action, if we go in the route of inaction. And in this, if we want to take the sort of the right route of action and create opportunity, opportunity to change, we need a couple of elements. And you mentioned the element number one, which is really leadership. And for leadership, you clearly mentioned also the leadership, which can be political leadership, leaders as uh, pol political leaders as facilitators or inhibitors. No, I think we, that's, uh, that's, we need facts and trust, with this, which is, uh, you just mentioned now, what, what are the prerequisites for trust. And that is, I think, the most in interesting and, and, and fascinating element, but also not easy element to activate, the activism, the engaged citizenship, and actually the global citizenship that you mentioned as 
one big opportunity in this much more connected world. So I think that that is uh, in, in terms of what we, you know, reaction or, or you know, preparation to, to deal with this world disorder, I think that you, you showed us that that is necessary. You also clearly outlined that, you know, there are these positive C's, as I call them, to deal with the negative C's, with the, con with the five C's that I, that I summarized. And the positive C's are also, you know, being more connected, uh, being more caring, having this concept of care in the leadership, but also of community embedded caring, being community embedded, taking the solutions which work in the community and making sure that they are uh, realized and in, in general making sure that we have, uh, th that we really uh, have much more of a crowd-based approach. And in there what I think also came out is that we will probably have a, a world where we do not have the single solution, we will have a world of ends, you know. We will have global citizenship but also national nationalism and also more national movements. We will have public and private having to deal with this, you know. Uh, and also we will have a coexistence of clearly uh, democracy and autocracy in, uh, in reacting to things with a clear preference on clearly on, on the democracy side, but, uh, but we, we know that that's uh, not so easy to, you know, it's, it's not the, the easiest, the easiest uh, political form to really get things done rapidly, particularly in crisis, that, but we need to overcome that. And you also very clearly stated that we need to have a bottom-up and a top-down approach combined uh, to react to this. So, um, and I think you know, one other element that you mentioned is on, on the trust is the blame game doesn't help us at all accountability is at the essence and also to make sure that we strengthen the democratic power you know we need much more accountability so I think that you gave us an enormous wealth of, uh, of inputs and insights and uh, I hope that we can really put some of those insights into action uh, not only here in Austria but more broadly and that we will make sure that we have the power of diplomacy, of the new diplomacy, and I think you gave some elements of how diplomacy needs to evolve, you know, um, to really realize the world 3.0 that we all aim to achieve. So thank you very much. Uh, we really thank you very much, Amadou, and uh, ask. It's fantastic. Yeah? Thank you.